Hello, thank you. Um, first of all, let me thank the organizers because I've long wanted to come to Israel. Um, and here I am, it's fantastic, thank you. And shalom. Um, yeah, so I am the deputy CTO of Opera. You might wonder how you can be a deputy chief. It just means I get more responsibility, but no extra money. Um, by the way, there's, there's lots of words on my slides, uh, but don't bother reading them, just listen to me, and I'll summarize them. But just in case you want them for the future, I'll put them online. So yeah, I, I'm an HGM alcoholic. Um, and I first fell in love with the web in 1999, when I was living and working in Bangkok. I set up and was head of primary at a school, and I got sick and I got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And when I came out of hospital, um, it's very rare in Thailand, this disease. And so there wasn't any English language information. So when I came out of hospital and I could walk again, I went across the road outside my apartment where there was this new thing called an internet cafe <clears throat> and typed in multiple sclerosis into Alta Vista, which was like Google, but powered by steam. And, uh, and I found a website called Julie's Joint, run by an English woman. But it was an international community of people with MS from Israel, Scotland, Norway, Canada, the States, all helping each other and supporting each other through their diagnosis. The point of that is it made me realize what a revolutionary medium we have that lets people from all walks of life, from all different nationalities, different kinds of machines, different operating systems, different browsers, could all collaborate and work together. And it made me realize that the web was kind of my spiritual home. And so I, I made a, a pledge to the web, and it goes like this. Oh, bollocks. Excuse me. <laughs> Wrecked my own joke there. It's the only joke in the whole thing. Gosh, this clicker's fun, isn't it? And the sound doesn't work. OK, that was the joke. Laugh. Thank you. So Thank you. So I want to make the web better. And I want to make the web better for developers. Because before I was doing this job, I was a web developer. And I love you all, each and every one of you as developers. And you have a right to go to the pub at 5 o'clock rather than 7 o'clock if the web's easier to develop on. <laughs> and I want to make the web better for the end users whom ultimately we serve, the people who buy the products and services from our clients or our bosses. And business owners, there are loads of businesses now that can only exist, really, because, because the web exists. And I want to make the web better for the next 4 billion people on the planet who do not have access. There are 7.4 billion people in the world, 7 billion living within mobile coverage, 5.2 billion have mobile phones, 3.2 billion are currently on the web, of whom only 1.1 billion have high-speed, fast access. And the other 4 billion deserve what we have. Uh, they come from India, China, of course, because those are just massive countries. Uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, but there's also uh, the US. 51 million people in the US do not have any internet access yet. So you need to ask yourself, where will your next customers come from. You almost certainly don't know, and the great thing is with the web, because you have global reach, you can often reach people that you don't expect. Uh, three Jewish guys in New York set up this website. It was a dating service um, aimed at more conservative Jewish families. So it was five guys and five girls go out to the cinema or something like that on a group date. But they weren't really, it wasn't really taking off. They had about 50,000 sign-ups. And they were kind of in the stage when they were going to give up. And they suddenly noticed they were getting loads and loads of traffic from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, because this group dating model worked really well with Orthodox, Sikh, Hindu, and Muslims. And they were getting more sign-ups from the subcontinent per week than they were getting a year in the US. So these guys who'd never been out of New York State moved to, to Mumbai, rebranded, and became the biggest dating site in India. They just didn't expect that, but the web allowed that because it's global. It was a website, not an iOS app. 
<laughs> yeah. But almost certainly, particularly in, in startup city like Tel Aviv, your next customers will come from within this circle. If only because of the numeric fact there are more human beings alive inside this circle than outside of it all put together. There are four billion people <coughs> in Asia now, and the UN predicts that by 2050, that will be five billion. By 2050 as well, the population of Africa will double to two billion. And by 2100, which is a little late for me, maybe not for some of you, by 2100, <coughs> the UN predicts that peak population will occur, and there will be five billion people in Africa alone. And everybody looks at this and goes, oh my God, they're all gonna starve. But do not worry, the Mercator projection lies to us. Africa is really, really big. You can fit China, the US, most of Europe, and India in the landmass of Africa. By 2100, 50% of the world's population will live in just these 10 countries. And only one of them is what we consider the Western world. In fact, by 2050, the population of Europe and the US will have declined as the rest of the world goes up. So if your next customers are not coming from these emerging economies, your customer base will be shrinking. China. China is 1.3 billion people at the moment, GDP growth of 7.7%. The sums of money that change hands on the web are staggering. In uh, whatever that awful day is in the States, Black Friday or Cyber Monday, $2.9 billion was taken last year. On double 11 day, the 11th of November in China, 9.2 billion US dollars changed hands. That was 2014. In 2015, that sum had been exceeded within five hours. It's predicted that by 2019, one trillion US dollars will change hands on the web in China. Indonesia, a, pop a country I'm going to quite soon, this, um, this is one of the most active social media using populations in the world, yet 75% of users are on older 2G and 50% of people report network problems every day, primarily because it's thousands of islands. Bangladesh, 157 million, 7% GDP growth, often overlooked when looking at the Asian economies, but it was the, oh shit, excuse me, it was the first country, that, that was bad Hebrew, I'm sorry, it was the first country in South Asia to adopt cellular technology, and by 2011, 50% of households had access to a mobile. Myanmar, 53 million, 13.6% GDP rise. Recently, the price of a SIM in Myanmar dropped from 2,000 US dollars to $1.50. Oh no. India, 1.2 billion, 6.9% GDP growth. The number of internet users will double from 190 million to 400 million, and it will contribute 5% of total GDP. That's 200 billion by 2020. These are not unimportant markets. What do these people have in common? Interestingly for me, because I'm an old hippie, emerging economies, people in emerging economies, see themselves primarily as global citizens rather than national citizens. Nigeria, China, Peru, and India are particularly the case. Uh, thank you to the BBC for letting me use their graphic. I notice as well that the UK is just under 50%, which seems to be reflected in our recent catastrophic referendum there. They didn't, they didn't survey people in Israel, but I'd be willing to bet it's a, a, a country that sees itself primarily as global. Also, the, all these people coming to the web are coming on smartphones. There, there's already a generation of people, my kids, etc., who don't really think of a computer as something like this. It's something they hold in their hand. But there's a more profound commonality as well. So Opera Mini, which my employers make, but I have access to the stats, in last month, the top 10 domains visited by Opera Mini users in the US are these, and I need to stress I, can, I only have access to aggregate figures. We can never track what an individual does. But the top 10 domains, I've taken away porn, by the way, because those are very common in the top 10 everywhere. And there's a code of conduct, so I can't show you the best URLs. Um, 
but <laughs> yeah, the top 10 are search, uh, then number two is stalking your high school sweetheart, weird videos of kittens on skateboards, <clears throat> uncensored information, news, etc. The top 10 handsets in the USA, <sighs> unsurprisingly, I should, a man with MS should never have a crappy clicker. Uh, the top 10 handsets in the US are unsurprisingly high-end. The top 10 domains in Indonesia for the same time period, stalking your high school sweetheart, search, blogs, kittens on skateboards, uncensored information, and some local stuff. The top 10 handsets are, of course, as you might expect, lower end. There's some Nokia Ashes, there's a few uh, Android, cheaper Android devices. The top 10 domains in Nigeria, lo and behold, search, child, childhood sweetheart, kittens on skateboards, the news, uncensored information. And the top 10 handsets in Nigeria are lower end again. But what this shows is that across the world, and I can repeat this with Ghana, Ethiopia, etc. the top, <coughs> what it shows is that around the world, regardless of your disposable income to afford the handsets, People want to consume the same kinds of goods and services, maybe the ones that you or your employers make. So what we're doing <clears throat> to make the web better for these people is we're doing some supply side improvements. This is a cake eaten by my colleagues in Opera who commit to the Blink web project. That's the engine that powers uh, Opera for Android, Opera Desktop, and Google Chrome, and the Yandex browser. Um, we are, Opera, are the second or the third biggest committer. Depends which month it is. It's always Google first, and then Samsung or Opera as the second biggest committer. We're actively involved in it. The Google guys tend to be looking at 60 frames per second for really good performance, and so are we. But we're also looking at making it more memory efficient, a smaller binary footprint, and lower power consumption, because those are things that particularly matter in the markets that we serve. There's also other stuff too. I'll just use the keyboard. <clears throat> We're working on something called progressive web apps, and this is a collaboration really between Mozilla, Google, and, and Opera. The Google guys specified some of it. The spec for the manifest is written by Marcos Caceres of, of Firefox, and Opera has been involved in implementing it. This is a way of making a native app-like experience but not siloed into one particular operating system, so you get the reach of the web. So what users love about native apps is they install them to the home screen. They want an icon for that site on the home screen. They don't want to go into the browser and hunt and peck through bookmarks. Uh, at Opera, we discovered that with stats we'd had since uh, the early 2000s, we discovered that 90% of users on desktop never opened a pre-installed book bookmark and never added a bookmark. That figure's even lower on mobile because it's harder to find stuff in mobile browsers. So installing to the home screen gives users that feeling of owning the app and being able to reach it easily. <clears throat> they can have their own icon, which you as a developer define. They can launch full screen, portrait or landscape, as you define as a developer, for an immersive experience. But they live on the web. It's not tens of megabytes of APK. And this is important because the average Android app gets uninstalled by 77% of users within 24 hours. Most apps are not used at all. Some research by Google last year showed the average app user has 36 apps on his or her phone, of which one in four are never used. And people uninstall them because they're big. We, as a test, not particularly scientific test in Opera, we installed the native apps for these popular web pro uh, properties, and we installed the progressive web app version. 460 meg for the native apps, one meg cumulatively for the progressive web app. This matters because people with cheaper devices have much less storage. <clears throat> as uh, a blog post called Mobile App Developers Are Suffering, said, with space this limited, the user is comparing their personal photo collection with the adoption of a new app. Probably for you, your smartphone is the most personal device you have. I know for me, if somebody runs off with my MacBook Air, 
and a bit pissed off. But if somebody runs off with my phone, they've kind of got my life. And it would be really, really terrible. And people in emerging economies are no different. When the World Bank surveyed consumers in Africa and asked them what they use their phone for, phone calls, obviously, text messages, missed calls. Do you, do you know what those are? This is, this is something I saw in India. It's to save you your money. If you want to contact a company, you ring, it, you ring the number once, and then they phone you back so you don't have to spend money. Uh, games, music, transferring airtime. This is really popular in sub-Saharan Africa as a method of paying people. If you don't have cash, you transfer $10 worth of airtime to their number. But what this shows is that people do very personal things on their devices. It's a, it's a, a, a personal home in your pocket. And if they have to choose between videos of their kids or their favorite music and your app, Birdly, they wrote a blog post why you shouldn't bother making a native app when they close theirs down. We didn't stand a chance. We were fighting with both our competitors and other apps for a few more megabytes of room inside people's phones. In Nigeria, because data is so expensive, I, d I interviewed uh, a developer from conga.com, which is a Nigerian e-commerce site, and he said that people don't download apps. They pay somebody in a store to load apps up from a PC, and they never, ever update them. But because a progressive web app lives on the web, there's no updating. You always get the newest version. So a progressive web app looks like this. It's simply a manifest file. And the manifest file is pointed to from the head of your HTML document. And if you're using a browser that doesn't understand progressive web apps, this is just ignored, and it renders as a website. Nobody gets a worse experience. And the manifest looks like this. It's just simple text. It's JSON. It just says things like, here's a big icon, here's a small icon. I'd like you to launch full screen. I'd like you portrait or landscape, etc. Tiny. That and the icons are the only things that are downloaded and stored on the phone. When the user encounters a progressive web app, she can add it to the home screen and then start it up by tickling it into life with a finger, just like a native app, like this. And it launches. This is launching in standalone mode. So you have the status bar at the top and the Android keys at the bottom. But if you want to, you can say, launch full screen, and it will take over the whole screen. You can say, I want it to be portrait. You can say, I want it to be landscape. And this is a fully immersive experience with an icon on the home screen, indistinguishable from a native app, from a UX perspective. It's really easy to make a manifest. In fact, probably most of the information already sits in your site in meta tags. Um, I wrote a manifest generator with my friend Stuart Langridge that will go through the header tags, the meta tags in your site and try to write a manifest for you and prompt you for any missing information. And there's pwa.rocks. You can go there and actually look at some real progressive web apps. Interestingly, lots of the most advanced ones are coming out of India and Indonesia, just the countries we discussed earlier. With sites that are really good, they're secure, they work offline, Chrome for Android and Opera for Android and presumably Firefox for Android when it's fully implemented will offer to the user, do you want to add this to home screen? You as a developer don't need to do anything. As long as your site is secure and works offline, if the user showed repeated engagement, and currently we define that as visiting two pages within five minutes, we'll reward good sites by offering it to be downloaded to home screen. But there's a discoverability problem with that. <coughs> uh, a friend of mine, Stuart, who co-wrote the generator with me, he pointed out that one of the great things about apps for, for businesses is you can say, go to the app store and download our app. But you wouldn't know that a site is a progressive web app until you've shown some repeated engagement and seen this banner. So in Opera, we've got a labs build, and we're experimenting with what we call ambient badging. If we detect that a site is a progressive web app, we'll show this uh, little Android icon next to the URL, and then the user clicks that, and it offers to go to the home screen. There's another problem 
a problem at with, with aggressive web apps as well. If they're full screen, you never see the URL, which means it's hard to share that URL. And copying and pasting URLs is in the DNA of the web. It's not called the web because it's full of videos. It's called the web because it's full of links to documents. So we're experimenting with this new gesture, pull down, and then go across. And it will pop the progressive web out, out into the browser, so then you can copy and paste the URL. Personally, I'm not sure this is entirely discoverable enough yet, which is why it's a labs build rather than a shipping product. Flipkart, which is a big e-commerce site in Bangalore, uh, Bengaluru in India, they shut down their mobile site and pointed everybody to the native apps. And only 4% of people who'd actually taken the trouble to go to the URL ever downloaded the app. So they reversed their policy and they made an aggressive web app. They find 40% returning visitors week over week, an increase in 63% conversions from home screen visits, and consumers spend three times the time they used to browsing the site. They do this because they want Flipkart Lite available on every phone over every flaky network in India. This is the way to get the reach of the web, but with good UX and browsers that support it. They live on the server, so there's no distribution problem. You don't have to wait for your customer to go to a coffee shop and get free Wi-Fi to download tens of megabytes of updates. They go to the web server, and they get the most modern version of your app. Thus, there's no app store or gatekeeper, nobody taking 30% off you. There are normal websites on browsers that don't support progressive web apps, like Opera Mini, Safari, and Windows phones. It's progressively enhanced to become an app. It's just a site on those devices. They're searchable, indexable, and linkable, therefore, because they live on the web. And they can work offline. And going offline used to be impossible. If you weren't connected to the web and you typed in a URL, you get some like a boring message like this uh, from, the, from your browser. We thought, this we thought we had this fixed with app cache. But it's fair to say that if the HTML5 APIs had a party, app cache would be the one getting gently drunk on cheap cider and not snogging anybody. And I know how bad that feels. So uh, I don't really. Um, <laughs> as Hixie, the editor of HTML5, said, the app cache API is a big mistake. It's the best example of not understanding the problem before designing the solution. And I'm still trying to fix that mess. But he probably doesn't need to, because we have a new cool thing that allows you to go offline. It's so cool that I cracked open my copy of Photoshop and designed a logo for it, which I'm giving to the W3C Creative Commons. Service workers. I don't need to leave that up this long. But really, look at the cat. Look into its eyes deeply. Listen to my voice. Use opera and wake up. <laughs> so so <laughs> service workers is a JavaScript hook into something that's been in all browsers forever, but you've never had access to it. And a service worker, and this is a grotesque trivialization or a simplification because you could spend hours talking about it, but it allows you to see what's happening between the browser and the network. So if, a, if somebody tries to follow a link and they're offline, your service worker can take some kind of remedial action. What that remedial action is, is entirely up to you. So for example, suppose you were writing a webmail client. Obviously, if you don't have network, you can't send or receive emails, but you might still want to compose an email or delete some old ones or move them into folders. That's the kind of remedial action you'd need to take, but you have to write it. There's no magic there. Very trivially, if your browser is not connected to the internet, which is represented by a series of tubes, obviously, you don't get that sorry message anymore because the service worker can sit in the middle, look at the cat. You know what to download when you get home. This will allow you 
to have sites that really work offline. Again, bringing the user experience of native to the web. It also gives you push notifications. So you can spam people, no, you can, you can alert people to stuff. But use these things wisely, because if you send loads of push notifications, the punter is just going to turn them off for everybody. And it also gives you background sync, which is really interesting. To me, service worker and progressive web apps are best represented by this picture. Game changing. Thank you. <coughs> Something else we've done, and I'm going to bang on about it because I invented it, is responsive images. In about 2010, 2011, around Christmas time, uh, every conference I spoke at, developers said the biggest problem we have is image size because we want to send really great quality images to retina devices. But that means we have to send great quality images to all devices, which then have to squish them down and it's just wasted bandwidth. But the trouble is with, with images, the image element has precisely one source argument. You either have to choose a low resolution image, which looks terrible on a retina device, or a really great image, which gets squished down by older devices. So I wrote a blog post about this, and I was hung over, which is most of, most of my life, actually. And I wrote this blog post and suggested that we reuse the video element from HTML5 and set up a new element which I call picture. I actually wanted to call it Bruce, but I'm much too modest. It's my, my one fault, to be honest. Um, my idea wasn't good. It was a crappy idea that could never have worked. But it had enough usefulness that a man called Matt Marquis, who works for, uh, used to work, I think, for the Filament Group in Boston, also started looking at and suggested some changes. And then Tab Atkins from Google got involved. Marcus Caceres from Mozilla got involved. Um, and then a developer living in France called Yoav Weiss, he can write C++ code. But he didn't have any time because he was freelancing. So we had a, a Kickstarter campaign to raise 10,000 US dollars for him to give up client work and write the C++. And we raised $15,000 in a few days from the community, from people like you. Google and Opera contributed 1,000 each, I think. And Yoav gave up work, wrote the code for Blink. He also had time to write the code for WebKit. And now this stuff, these thingies, to use a technical term, picture, source set, the X descriptor, the W descriptor, the sizes attribute, are available in every browser, including Safari for iOS. So that's a bit of a triumph. When I did this talk two weeks ago in the UK, the next day, a talk about responsive images, the next day a developer in the audience wrote to me, and he said without even doing any kind of optimization, he'd reduced the images down to by 54% for smaller screens. That's a significant saving, particularly when you look at this, this was average from the Alexa top million sites. I made the graph on the 15th of April. The average web page is now 2.3 meg. Not website, web page is 2.3 meg, of which 1.4 uh, meg are images. So if you can take 54% of this, you are saving lots of bandwidth. That makes it faster for your customers. And we all know that time is money. Every millisecond that you delay, you are going to lose users. But bandwidth costs real people real money. To afford a 500 megabyte mobile data plan, you need to work for 34 hours on average wage in Brazil, 28 hours in Nigeria, six hours in the US, one hour in Germany. If your images are too fat, people just will not come to your site because you are costing them money and wasting their lives with work. And who wants to work? Another thing that people in emerging economies have are network problems. And a lot of them choose to get around this by using a proxy browser. I'm going to talk about Opera Mini because I'm able to, because it made by my employer. Other proxy browsers are available. Chrome, Silk, Puffin, UC Web, etc. A company called Sienta Mobile who make Werfel, if you know what that is. 
They, uh, they published this, they gave me permission to use it. Opera Mini apparently has 42% of the global market share of proxy browsers. Opera Turbo has 9%, then Chrome has 39%. And we made this, I think, in 2005 or something. It's for feature phones, because feature phones are so underpowered, they can't really run a browser. But people didn't like WAP. So what this does is it compresses everything on a massive, great, big server farm and sends a pre-rendered version of the web page to the client. It's analogous to a PDF, but it's interactive. And it works like this. Opera Mini is a thin client on Windows phones, Android, iOS, and Java-based feature phones. And then this whacking great big server, this one's in Iceland, his name is Thor. He's cooled by glacial water and powered by hydroelectricity. And that does all the work, because Thor, as you know, has a hammer. And when he sees a site, it gets squished down to as by Often we can squish it down to about 10% of its original size, which means it gets downloaded faster for the customer. And if they've got a constrained data plan, they can get 10 times as many web pages for their money. We've just started to block ads as well on the server if you turn it on. <laughs> which saves a further 14% of data and a whopping 40% faster to download a site. I don't hate ads. Opera makes money from ads, mostly in-app advertising. But when you are slowing people's sites down by 40%, you're doing it wrong. And, did, and customers basically use this as digital self-defense against bloated sites and high bills. Thus, with Opera Mini, we consume 14% less battery and 89% less data. Battery is performance too. If, like I did, you live in a congested city like Bangkok, you can be commuting two hours to work and two hours from work. You do not want your battery to die when you're sitting bored in a traffic jam on a public bus. In India, regularly, there's 10% more demand than supply for power. It's so bad that 30% of annual smartphone sales in the biggest retailer in India come bundled with a power bank. Thus, we're quite popular. Last month, I crunched the numbers yesterday, counted them all. Last month, we compressed 137,898,504,489 pages globally. That was 28 petabytes which we compressed into 4.5 petabytes in one month. A petabyte is a big number. To put it into perspective, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN does 600 million collisions a second. They collect the data, and on average, they collect 30 petabytes annually from 600 million collisions a second. We did 28 petabytes last month. It's a lot of traffic. But we get lots of users. There's 50 million users in India, 20 million in Russia, Indonesia, Nigeria, 10 million in China, Bangladesh, and Ukraine, etc. For the nerds like me, what's, it, what's bizarre or weird about Opera Mini is, I don't know about you guys, but when I grew up, you, you were downloading something from SourceForge, and it would say, choose the server nearest you, because it will be faster. But actually, our servers are nowhere near the people who are actually consuming the majority of Opera Mini's data, apart from China, because of the Chinese firewall. The servers are in Amsterdam, Iceland, East and West Coast, US. And the reason for that is, as we've seen, the majority of websites that are consumed globally tend to be big American companies. And the consumers live in places with networks as overloaded as this truck I photographed in northern India earlier this year. Yeah, I know. Didn't like being on that road, I can tell you. In India, 96,000 of the 736 cell towers are 3G enabled, but 35,000 of them only have a fiber optic connection to the backbone. There's really creaky networks. So if, for example, a user in Cape Town wants to visit a site, that one request is sent to our server in East Coast states 
That's the one that deals with Africa. Then that server in the States, which is close to Facebook or eBay or whatever, makes the 60 or so requests that the average web page has for images, CSS, JavaScript, across fast networks comparatively close to the server. Then that is compressed, pre-rendered, and the one, the one binary blob across a single TCP uh, connection is sent down to the end user. And because it's one binary blob, one connection, it's got a much better chance of getting through. And it's much easier on those congested networks. If you're interested in developing for emerging markets, there are things that you need to consider. Design, for example. Don't do that. In Thailand, to write somebody's name in red is to wish them dead. <laughs> and it's because when somebody dies, their body is walled up in a temple wall, and the name of the corpse is written on the temple wall in red. So if you write somebody's name in red in Thailand, you're wishing them dead. And I am no MBA, but I don't know that wishing somebody dead is a great way to start a, a healthy business relationship. Maybe I'm wrong. Don't do this. Require a given name and a family name. Tens of millions of people in Indonesia have just one name. This is my friend Putri. Her Twitter handle is only Putri because that is her name. And again, requiring somebody to make up a name or not understanding their culture is not a great way to form a meaningful business relationship. There are technical constraints as well. With Opera Mini and most of the proxy browsers, everything happens on the server. So everything needs a user-initiated interaction. Everything needs a server round trip. JavaScript on Opera Mini runs for five seconds and then is stopped. That's because lots of old sites have loads of document rights, etc. JavaScript only APIs, therefore, do not work. The, the watchword here is progressive enhancement. Design, also in Opera Mini, isn't always preserved. We don't do CSS rounded corners or gradients, for example. And that's because we can't rely upon low-powered clients to draw those things for us. So we would have to turn them into bitmaps, which would bloat the page rather than to compress it. And actually, these things are design, and the people who are the end users care about the content. We only show the first frame of animations, because animations consume CPU cycles, and CPU cycles drain batteries. We don't download web fonts for two reasons. Web fonts can be very big, particularly with CJ, CJK characters. They're, off, they're mostly just for design and branding. They're not for content. And also, for lots of older, smaller screens, the system fonts are carefully designed for that screen. So we use those instead. If you want icons, don't use icon fonts. Use SVG. That is what it's for. Use progressive enhancement. This is the absolute watchword. Airbnb. Do you all know Airbnb? It's a company that will give you $50 to let a stranger ooze onto your sofa. Um, they launched their first holy grail app into production. It looks exactly the same as the app it replaced, they said. But the initial page load felt drastically quicker. How did they accomplish this voodoo magic, you're asking? We serve up real HTML instead of waiting for the client to download JavaScript before rendering. Plus, it's fully crawlable by search engines. It feels five times faster. Who knew? Who could possibly have guessed? that HTML will be faster than loads of JavaScript, which needs to be parsed and executed. Of course, recently, we've seen a rise of the smartphones, and that caused, uh, caused me a bit of existential angst inside Opera. India and China and the States are the biggest markets, which is unsurprising, because they're the most populous countries. But the Middle East and Africa saw unprecedented year-on-year -year growth, and feature phone sales are down. So we thought with Opera Mini, well, we designed it for feature phones. Feature phones are going away. And we thought, oh, bugger. That's our most popular product. It's going to finish. But no. The here is 100 devices that you've almost certainly never heard of. These were the first 100 devices, Android devices, in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh that came pre-shipped, pre-installed Opera Mini. But why does a smart device need a proxy browser 
that is designed for feature phones? And the answer is Bruce's law of smartness, TM. Doesn't matter how smart your phone is if your network is dumb. This is taken out the window of my apartment in Bangkok. This is the state of infrastructure in much of the emerging markets and the developing world. Smartphones are coming down in price because of Moore's law, mass production, etc. But infrastructure like this across the Himalayas, across thousands of islands, will take decades to upgrade. And by the time it gets upgraded, more people will come online and then it will grind to a halt again. 92% of people live within range of a 2G network. But that's not fast enough for the internet as we know it, which is why people are still using proxy browsers. We've converted, I think, about 120 or 180 million of our Opera Mini users are on Android devices, even though those are smart devices that could feasibly run a full browser, but the network is the, is the bottleneck. If you want to test an Opera Mini, uh, you, by all means use it, I'd love you to, but I'm not asking you to use it, but I'm asking you to test in it, because those are where some of your consumers are going to be coming from. You should know that on smart devices, we have two modes. We have a web view mode, which we call high mode, and that gives about 50% compression. But it's fully, it's fully JavaScript and web compatible. That 50% that compression is to do with aggressive caching, uh, on the fly, transcoding big PNGs and JPEGs to WebP formats, which saves about 33% of data. And we have extreme mode, which is when all of the rendering is done on the server, but that can break JavaScript. On iOS, it defaults to high mode. On Android, we default to extreme mode, except in some territories where we know the network is fast enough. Windows phones and Java feature phones only have extreme mode. But one of the things blocking the advancement of the web in emerging markets and developing markets are demand side problems. This smartphone sales have either flatlined or are going down, depending upon which report you believe. One of the reasons for that could be the Chinese slowdown. Another reason could be just classic saturation. Everybody has one, or everybody who could afford one has one. But I noticed this when I was in Barcelona at a, at a trade fair. This was given to me by a Chinese company that make them. This is a dual SIM phone. It's not Wi-Fi enabled, it's 2G. It's, it's being retailed in Africa for $2.36. And they told me if I buy 100,000, they'll give it to me half price. I didn't, because I don't, you know, 100,000 phones, I'm not, I'm not a teenager. But for people for whom 60 to $100 is still close on a month's salary, this might just be enough for them if this can access the web for $2.36. There's also the problem that in Africa, seven out of 10 people who don't use the internet say they don't know how to, and four in 10 say they don't know what it is. And this is not only an African thing. In high-income Poland and Slovakia, one-fifth of adults can't use a computer. In the States, 41% of seniors do not use the internet at all. And this is, there's definitely a digital divide in the UK that we see. This is my friend Paul doing tech support for his mum. What buttons are on your screen? His mum said a hot water bottle and a dentist's chair. <laughs> this is a video taken by some friends of mine from Club Internet and they do usability testing in rural Pakistan. This is a guy in his 20s. He's a feature phone user. He's heard of the internet, but he's never used it. And they give him a smartphone and tell him, go to Google and type in the name of your favorite actress. I've edited this down. Two minutes, 53. Three minutes and eight seconds. And 
and at three minutes and 15 seconds, he just gives up. His, his difficulty, I imagine, because I wasn't present at the test, his difficulty, he was a feature phone user, and he had a real keyboard, and he just doesn't know how to summon up the virtual keyboard here. But you can see this is a real problem. Not everybody, of course, has this difficulty. At Christmas, I was uh, on a beach, and I met this Cambodian boy, and within one minute of mimed instructions, he'd taken this selfie. So people can and do learn. I love that picture, it cheers me up. Change is possible, said the car park machine in my favorite Chinese restaurant. <laughs> Developing countries are home to 94% of the global offline population. And there's a digital divide within those countries as well. There's a digital divide between rich and poor, male and men and women, location, cities or rural, and age. India, for example, the day before I landed in India in February, uh, the Times of India published this report. The number of mo rural mobile internet users in India grew by a staggering 93% between December 2014 and December 2015. That 93% now means that 9% of rural Indians have any access to the internet, compared with 53% of urban dwellers. So the World Bank, in a report called Digital Dividends that came out in February, said making the internet universally accessible and affordable should be a global priority. We talked about ad blocking earlier. Um, the industry standard that they're trying to push through for lean ads suggests that video ads should be skippable after 15 seconds. Eight digital ads in one month, uh, eight digital ads in a day, that would make two minutes. In Nigeria, the data, the data costs needed to watch two minutes of online video a day costs more than sending your child to school for a month. In many countries, digital products are taxed as luxury goods. I'm not gonna read out the names of those, I'll put the slides online tomorrow. There is a grassroots coalition called Fast Africa. Fast stands for fast, affordable, secure, transparent. And they had lots of events in African cities and African countryside uh, between May the 1st and 7th this year. Their primary demands, there's 10 of them, but the ones that interest me the most, they want fair and transparent ICT, ICT taxes. They want governments and donors to step up efforts. They want what they call one for two. They want one gigabyte of data to cost no more than 2% of monthly income. They want investment in public access solutions, so computers in libraries, schools, etc. And they want getting women online to be a top priority. The World Bank again, online work can prove particularly beneficial for women, youth, older workers, and the disabled, who may prefer the flexibility of working from home or flexible working hours. Across Africa, women make up only 25% of the total non-agricultural employment. But online work in Africa, women make up 45% of the workforce. When Africans were asked the, most, the best advantages of online work, women overwhelmingly said it's the ability to work from home and work flexible hours. They were much less interested in the actual money. That could probably be because, like everywhere else, women get paid less than men in Africa. More women than men reported that payment is simply not good enough as the primary disadvantage of working online. But it can work. In Kerala, in India, uh, the government set up a, a, a project called Kudumbashri, which translates into prosperity for the family. And they outsourced IT work to women in poor areas. 90% of those women had never previously worked outside the home. The World Bank also say access to the internet is critical, but it's not sufficient. And this is the quote, the full benefits of the information and communication transformation will not be realized until countries continue to improve their business climate, invest in people's education and health, and promote good governance. I'm banging on about the benefits of the web, but clean water, good, good and fair governance are more important and a predicate to internet access. But this really matters. Uh, McKinsey 
who are a massive, great big uh, management consultancy to huge corporations and governments said, an increase in internet maturity similar to the one experienced in mature countries over the past five years creates an increase in real GDP per capita of $500 on average. It took the industrial revolution of the 19th century 50 years to produce the same results. Thank you for listening.